Hello. Welcome to this discussion on the AI predictions for 2022. Uh, today, I'm joined by Brad Cordova. Uh, Brad Cordova is the super AI founder and CEO. Uh, myself, Pascal Bornet, I'm the chief data officer for ERA Technology and the author of the Intelligent Automation book. Uh, Brad, very happy to have you with us today. How yeah, are you? Same, same here. I'm always excited to talk about AI, so I'm excited for our conversation. Excellent. So let's deep dive into it. Uh, Brad, thanks sure. for that. You sent me a few days ago a few predictions uh, for 2022 in AI. Uh, a few predictions, not a few, a long list of predictions, basically <laughs> 11 of them. Um, uh, and of course, we won't have the time to go through each of uh, each and every one of the, those ones. So what I've done uh, over the last few days is extract from those predictions the key themes uh, of 2022. Um, and I would say the overall overarching idea uh, for 2022 is uh, AI focusing more on business, on the use case, on the value that we create, um, on building applications and not models. I think we'll, co we'll come back to that uh, soon. Uh, about, in one word, maybe about scaling, basically, uh, enabling scaling AI in companies. Uh, so the key points of the discussion that I would like to have with you today, uh, let me know if you're happy with that. Uh, the first one is starting with new platform capabilities that help to bring a higher business value. Okay, the second is um, combining technologies um, to create more value and uh, especially involving unstructured data. Um, the third one could be the importance of humans in the loop. So, so a centered, a human centered transformation. Um, and finally, we can talk about the changes in people roles that are implied by, by those technology trends. Um, if we have the time, we could maybe talk about the impact of automation and AI on jobs. Um, does it, uh, what do you think about that? I think I think that's a really good summary, and um, I'll, I'll be happy if we get to all those points. <laughs> so let's try and and deep dive into it right now. So um, some of your predictions um, are about uh, new platform capabilities that help to build higher business value that are more focused on use cases on on the business values. Um, can you tell us a, a bit more about that? Yeah, so you see this a lot with any technology that comes out. Typically, new technologies start as a interesting R&D science experiment, and the ones who survive that phase eventually get used to drive economic value. And that's where we're at today with AI. So how, how I made the prediction is we're going to see the commoditization of what we call AI models and the mm -hmm. rise of AI applications. And and this follows in that same trend. And so what I see is instead of an isolated R&D group sitting in, in, in the back of the office, the AI projects are connected throughout the entire organization. And in, instead of just being something flashy or, or the deliverable is a great demo, it's really about the, the ROI in the system. And, and and this is really important. I, I think this is this is the core of that, and I think kind of underlies a, a lot of the things you mentioned. Um, so so I think that's a big one. Yes. And I, I don't know your thoughts are on that. No, I, I I completely agree with you, especially on the collaboration part of it, where um, as, as you as you said, uh, uh, um, the AI. Um, centers of excellence or, or R&D teams shouldn't be isolated from the business so that they can really um, focus on bringing the highest value, um, starting by identifying the right use cases together with the business and then build those AI applications with the business hands in hands, um, uh, programming and then testing with the business to make sure that this is aligned with the needs. and. Um, and I feel that today we are in lack of such platforms on the market. And and um, and and I really appreciate appreciated the point that you that you raised here. 
Yeah, and I mean, I think in terms of infrastructure and platforms, I mean, we'll get into hyper automation and, and I mean, you, you wrote the book on that literally, but I, I think before that, quite a technical point that's really specific to machine learning, I think is this point of, of quote unquote AI safety. So the as we know, the, the power of, of machine learning is that it learns from data, the algorithms implied through some kind of gradient descent. And so, if you train it on some data distribution, it's going to learn the patterns of that data distribution. And if you run it on your test set, it's going to say, let's say, 95% accuracy. But then if you change the distribution, what pe what surprises people is it's no longer 95% accurate because this problem doesn't plague software. And so stemming from that, you have all these problems uh, with machine learning. It's very powerful, but its greatest strength is also its greatest weakness. And I think another, and this is more of a technical point, but another trend of 2022 is, is AI safety. And so this is, can you build AI with guarantees? Can you handle covariate shift? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you handle governance, AI explainability, AI uncertainty estimation? Um, and I think, I think this, is, this is really yes. important and it's still in its research phase, but this is something we focus on a lot at Super AI because we're making real applications mm. and you need real guarantees. And, and we figured out a great way, kind of pinging off Henry Ford, of decomposing complex problems into simple problems. And this old idea, this 100 year plus idea, turns out to take us a big step along that direction. Excellent. I, I see it. I mean, listening to you, I see it like a, like a platform that would, uh, first of all, focus on, I mean, clarify the, the needs and the objectives of building a certain application and um, monitoring these goals throughout the building process of these applications. Huh? Is it in order to, as you said, um, uh, build safely those applications, meaning making sure that we that we reach those goals at the end. Uh, and that's what you had. I, I I agree, and I, I think that's important in every application, no matter what you're building. But it's particularly important when you're building AI machine learning based applications, because when you when you write software, you can write integration tasks, unit tasks, because it's it's deterministic. The the algorithm comes from the programmer's head, and you write if and if statements and, and for loops, um, and it's deterministic logic for the most part. Whereas machine learning is probabilistic and statistical, and so if your unit test fails, well, is it because something's wrong, or is it just if your algorithm's ninety five percent accurate? Well, you would expect it to fail five percent of the time, and does it happen to be in that five percent? So there's this whole new modality around quality that is very unintuitive for people and mm. machine learning models can silently fail and because it's probabilistic it, it makes this whole monitoring thing take on a totally different importance and so i, I agree 100 percent yes um and so i uh, hearing also from you here i can understand that uh, this platform would also um um, um, yeah, efficiently monitor those processes uh, 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 throughout the building of those applications. Um, and um, uh, it, it makes me think of, of a, a trend that I really like to talk about, um, I, which I really believe in, basically. Uh, it's, uh, and it comes from a fact, basically, that is very ironic. Today, most of the um, artificial intelligence transformations are human intensive. They are manual, basically. Huh? What we do currently when we build an AI application is, is done manually, programming manually, uh, finding the, the use cases manually, interacting with the business users manually. Um, but what if technology could help us uh, do this uh, easier and faster? Um, um, so typical process of building an application, I start with identifying use cases, then uh, uh, designing those use cases into into an AI model, and then and then um, performing those tests and and going into production, um, uh, and and um, so some some applications such as process discovery uh, that helps to identify uh, more in the 
process automation space? Uh, what are what are the use cases that can be automated, uh, or data discovery that can help to identify um, the relationship between data so that you can build models with multivariates that that helps to to improve the, the accuracy of of the predictions. Those type of of um, of applications, uh, or you can think also of auto ML, auto machine learning that helps to to automate some of the time consuming tasks that data scientists are doing, huh? such as um, testing um, testing different models on this on on the same data. Um, uh, is it is it also something that that for you is part of this um, AI safety uh, application platform? I would say. Yeah, so I have a very particular prediction about this. So when I look at the history of intelligent applications, let's say going back even to the 1950s and or even in the 1980s when uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov or when uh, we, we've kind of beat Lee Sedol in, in, in Go, what I see machine learning AI excel at is what I call closed systems. So, so whereas Go and Chess kind of has a, a, a combinatorically un, expansive and al almost unsolvable amount of moves, it's still a closed system. And in these closed systems, I think if, if there is closed systems that exist, AI will quickly become better than humans at that. I think the last thing AI will conquer is open systems. These are these are really difficult. And I think a lot of these process discoveries, I think the question of having an infinite number of things to do and narrowing that down to a finite number, I, I think that's gonna be a very long time before AI can do that. I think AI is gonna solve most closed systems in, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. But I think humans role will be elevated to these these open systems, and I think a lot of these problems you mentioned, not all of them, um, are open systems, and I don't think AI will solve those. There's you mentioned auto ML, like auto ML is solving uh, only really simple tasks right now, and it's going to yeah. get more uh, advanced. But I, I think to solve open systems, and a lot of my research I was doing during my PhD at MIT, it was just it was it became even more clear to me that that that's the case yes yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you that we are not yet there fully yeah still some way to go oh yeah um yes. one thing you did mention though is that in a lot of these ai systems it's still very human dominant even in yeah. a fully automated system it's humans labeling data essentially programming the machine learning models I mean, in, in supervised learning and most data on the internet is generated by humans anyways. So even if you're doing self-supervised learning, the, the models are still essentially being programmed by humans. And I think a lot of people try to reject this as it's somehow a bug and not a feature, especially if we look at a lot of my friends who are at Google or, or Microsoft, they're, they're just trying to create purely automated systems. and our thesis is rather than treat that as a bug, we treat that as a feature. And the observation come, came from, from chess. I, I love playing chess. And the, the best chess players aren't human chess players. The, the best chess players aren't machines. Actually, the best chess players are human plus machines together. Um, yeah. And when you look at a lot of case studies in the real world, for example, PayPal, they were struggling to be profitable because there was so much fraud and they tried the most advanced machine learning models, they tried just human and they couldn't get profitable. But when they merged human and AI together, working together, because they're very orthogonal. Um, and when you have two orthogonal systems, you kind of, uh, when you combine them, you get uh, maximal uh, uh, power between them. And so we took that idea and uh, over the last three years, made it mathematically rigorous and, and built our system around this. We have this router that can route between humans, AI and, and software, and then combine them in a smart way. And then we have 150 quality control, over 150 plus quality control mechanisms. And then, it, and so I think instead of trying to deny this fact or try to hide this fact, 
I think it's really important to see this as a reality and, and see this actually as a as a benefit. Um, and I think when you do that, it becomes really powerful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, thanks. I think it was it was a it was a great discussion around the, the first theme, um, the new platform capabilities to help us build more business value uh, with a more business focus and. Um, uh, a, a, a second theme that I wanted to to, to discuss with you that is extremely uh, hype for the moment and and um, and that I'm also passionate about, it's about combining technologies um, uh, to create more value. So, so basically, to be able to address more complex use cases, um, and this involves as, as well unstructured data. Um, uh, I remember. I mean, I, I, I read in, in in your email um, the capacity to have different models interoperate between themselves, connect between themselves. Uh, the capacity also to leverage unstructured data to to get to get more value out of those those uh, those applications. Um, can you can you tell me more about that? Yeah, and and I, I definitely also looking forward to to hearing. Uh, your your opinion on this, but I'll I'll kick it off. Yeah, so if if we look at the world today, um, in ninety percent of the world's data was created in the last two years, and if you double click on that, eighty percent of that data is unstructured data, um, as opposed to structured data. So as you know, but if someone's listening, uh, structured data is data that can fit into your spreadsheet. It has rows and columns and the computer can understand this because it's structured. Unstructured data is data such as images, audio, video, text, data that doesn't fit organically in a spreadsheet. So 80% of this data is unstructured and unstructured data, sometimes people call it hidden data. You can't directly use it with your computer without adding structure to it. Uh, our, our human brains can can process that because we take the unstructured data, convert it into electrical signals, which are then structured in, in, into neural activities. But our computers can't do that yet. And so, one of one of the most important things you want to do is, since most or eighty percent of the data in the world, that means eighty percent of the enterprise data is unstructured. If you want to use all the things you invested millions and millions of dollars in, like RPA. Uh, your software infrastructure, your machine learning infrastructure, you you need to get into a structured format. And that's what we focus on at Super AI. We do unstructured data processing, but but this this turns out to, to be really important. And it is a key if you want to unlock the collaboration between these technologies, between RPA, between let's say Amazon's AI models or Google's AI models or open source AI models, and and between humans, um, you have to you have to transfer the unstructured data in a format which all these people can understand. And I, I think that's really the starting point between uh, this collaboration you you mentioned. I have a lot more to say, but let me pause and, and not monologue here. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts as well. Yes, yes, yes. So 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 yeah, like really critical to. To um, to be able to tackle this this unstructured data, as you said, it's it's eighty percent of the of the of, of the company's data for the time being. We've only worked on one percent of them. Uh, that's what I read. Um, um, do you have an idea of the, the the potential value that we could get from using this unstructured data in in the world in in companies? Yeah, so you can you can estimate this a number of different ways. Obviously, top down, bottom up, but the the, the latest estimate I've seen is right now, it's a, about a $15 billion market. Um, so what we're seeing is three multi-billion dollar companies in the RPA space. And what RPA is doing, they're using software instead of AI to handle structured data instead of unstructured data. And in the unstructured data market, not only is there more data, um, but there's more problems that need to be handled. And so, we're seeing a lot of growth, some of the fastest growing companies in the world on a really tiny amount of data. And so imagine bigger problems yes. on, on bigger data. It, it's a really big market. Amazing. And it's across, I mean, uh, 
types of unstructured data are obviously uh, anything that is written, like emails, like like conversations, but also um, videos. Is it videos? Um, what else? Um, Even satellite data. Yes. Um, yeah. There's there's a lot of different types of of data out there, and I think I think there's even a, a bigger point here, and I don't want to go too far out in the future. But if if you look in the history of the human race, where you have, for example, the printing press that allowed that essentially created a protocol for more people to uh, communicate, and you look kind of like the GDP per capita when that came out, there was a massive spike. Um, if you look at the let's say industrial revolution another mass if you look at when the internet came out another massive spike in, in in gdp and so what what happens during these points where you develop some technology that can connect people instead of us being individuals we become in a way this collective consciousness where now we can almost access all of the, the collective knowledge of humanity on the internet that hasn't yet happened with machine learning. Mm-hmm. Machine learning models don't talk to each other the way humans talk to each other on, on the internet. And so there's this really latent intelligence that I think is waiting to be unlocked, but it needs a protocol. This is something else we're, we're working on at Super AI. We, we developed the protocol just like there's the TCP IP protocol where computers can talk to each other. There needs to be a protocol that makes it easy for machine learning models to talk to each other. But I think once you do that, we're again going to see a huge spike in the in intelligence of uh, of AI. And and then if we can connect that to RPA and connect that to humans, then it's it's going to be a, a, another huge spike. Yes. And and so I think that's a kind of another long term uh, vision of hyper automation. But on the same time, it's very practical because. Yes. There's a lot of things that humans can do right now that AI can't do. There's things that software is much better at that you would never want to use AI for um, in RPA. And there's just things that are much better for, for AI that, that software could never do. Yes, and we've heard about, a lot about GPT-3 huh, over the last uh, 18 months. Um, GPT-3, the the, um, the largest uh, and and most sophisticated language uh, programming um, uh, application uh, launched by OpenAI, I think it was in in 2020. Um, where where do you position Super AI in compared to 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 GPT three? So so our another one of our uh, theses is that um, it, it's along the lines of the commoditization of models. So. Our goal is not to develop, let's say, the best machine learning model, um, because let's say even if we do, there's maybe going to be a hundred trillion parameter GPT model going to come out the next day, or or there's always going to be a better model. What we decided to focus on is the actual protocol. So we collaborate with Amazon, Google, a a lot of open source things as well. And so... What we do is we actually use the GPT-3 model and GPT-NEO, and, and there's there's a few other ones that have come out. And you can, with the click of a button, integrate it into the, the Super AI system, and the router will treat that as another worker to possibly route to. And, and maybe it'll route to GPT-3 and GPT-NEO, maybe GPT-2. And then the combiner will combine those into a single output along with a human and maybe a software bot. And so... So we're actually not in com- competition with with any of, of of these companies who who build machine learning models, but instead we use them and we try to use them. We try to squeeze the juice out of them as much as mm-hmm. possible. We give them guarantees. We combine them with human and AI, and this turns out to be very practical because typically b- before someone meets Super AI, um, they they want to solve some automation problem and they're trying to make this choice of, do I use AI? Do I use RPA? Do I use BPOs and use pure humans? We feel it's a false choice because they all have pros and cons. And so we turn that or into an end of why, why, why do you have to, why, why not use them all? And you've probably made a certain investment 
um, in, in each of these. And so why not plug them into a single platform, have kind of mathematical guarantees um, and, uh, and, and, use, and use them all. Okay, exciting. Yes, yes. Not don't reinvent the wheel, but build on this to to to, to create more value for, for for businesses for companies. Exactly. Um, uh, one of the so so I think it was very important to talk about unstructured data as a starting point to talking about combining different technologies uh, to build a higher value. Um, indeed, most as we just discussed, most of the data in companies is unstructured. If you can grab those data, you can benefit from them, and you can create more value from all the for all the the applications that we built on top. Um, uh, talking about applications and models, um, I remember reading as well a very interesting part in your in your predictions that is about uh, connecting and and having models interoperate together. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, exactly. So, th this is this is what I was talking about about this protocol, and there there needs to be what I would call uh, an, a general AI marketplace. So, people still today, when they release models, mostly still release them to GitHub, and GitHub was designed for software. Right, so there, there's a lot of great tools that support your software development, and a lot of social tools so developers can collaborate. And this was really game changing. This kind of launched the world of open source um, to where we we see it today, and it just, uh, this started a bunch of other things. The the thing is, a lot of machine learning is built with software, and and so to a certain degree, it's appropriate to use GitHub, but with software comes, or sorry, with the rise of AI comes two additional things on top of software, and that's the data. Um, so you you need to track so many different things about the data um, because the algorithm is implied from the data. So if you, like, as we talked about, if you if you change the data, then it changes the algorithm. So you need to really make sure you know uh, what data you train this on. And then the second one is is the parameters of the model. So we could have uh, software which designs the model, but if you train it with this data set or that data set, it's going or if you train it with different hyperparameters, it's going to create different parameters of the model. So you need to track these as well. And there's a there's a third thing which SuperAI adds is we have this schema. So every machine learning model may uh, have as input an image and then output is classification or maybe video and there may be a time series text output. And so there's things like this that GitHub wasn't designed for. And I believe for this interoperability to be possible, we need another kind of quote unquote GitHub for AI. And there's a few projects that are making some good leaps in that direction, but they're still missing some key features. So I'm hoping someone will, will make even more progress on that. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks uh, for, for that. And and I'm I'm very passionate about the, the capacity of hyper automation that we call also intelligent automation uh, to, to to bring more benefits to companies. So so maybe just for those of you who are not aware of what is intelligent automation or hyper automation, uh, it's um, the capacity to automate end to end business processes um, by combining different technologies such as machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, robotic process automation. Um, uh, and, and for example, uh, let's take the example of a procure to pay end to end process. Every company in the world has, has, uh, is using this process, which is about, um, identifying, um, uh, pr of, uh, suppliers, um, select those suppliers. And here you can use machine learning, uh, uh based on ratings and history of those of those uh, of those vendors to select the best ones then it's about sending orders to those to those vendors leveraging workflow platform for example um, and it's uh, and after receiving the goods or services from the suppliers it's about uh, receiving their invoices and, and processing those invoices invoices are um, unstructured data so you need natural language processing to automatically process those those um, 
those invoices and finally the payment to, of those vendors is made using RPA because it's a very transactional activity. So uh, as you can see, combining those different technologies together helps to automate more than 80 to 90% of processes delivering 20 to 60% 20 to productivity improvement to companies according to the research we did in the book. Um, uh, so that's really a trend that is that is improving as well uh, customer experience because you go faster, um, employee experience because you, you allow the people in the company to focus on uh, the most interesting and value-added activities, freeing them up from those transactional repetitive activities. Um, Brad, what is your, your experience with hyper-automation and, and how do you use it at, at Super AI? So the things you said, I agree with, and and hyper automation in the way you defined it is really the core of the, the super AI system. So first of all, we, we make it really easy to integrate whatever AI model you're using, machine learning model, whether it's your homegrown, your home built machine learning model, whether you're using some open source model on GitHub, whether you're using SageMakers or, or Google AI's models, we make it easy to integrate. We make it easy to integrate humans they're using your own humans, we have a crowd around the world or if you're using BPOs and we make it easy to integrate software bots. So the, the first part is just, it sounds basic, but it's really important. If you could have the most amazing technology, but if it's too hard to integrate, no one's gonna use it. So yeah. step one is making it very easy to integrate all these technologies you said. And then step two is we spent a tremendous amount of time on a framework so that these can all work together and talk to each other in a again a very easy way we're not talking about you have to be a, a genius and a phd in in all this in in all this stuff to get it to work any business user can use it we we made it really easy and it actually works <laughs> that's the most important part that was that, that's key because it it sounds nice to talk about all this in theory but at the end of the day as we talked about, we're, we're moving away from the, the, science, the isolated science projects into a world where this needs to deliver real value. And it's easy to get it running quickly. It's really hard to get this running on at scale uh, at the enterprise grade level. And, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's very, very key to everything we do. And I like the way you mentioned it. And as you were saying that, it, it reminded me of, of Adam Smith actually and the specialization of labor. Every time we specialized as humans and then we collaborated, let's say I was better at fishing and you were better at getting coconuts and we, we traded fish for coconuts, we we're all better off. And then when we were able to tame animals, we extended the specialization of labor across species. And then we had oxes farming for us instead of us having to do it. And this is just a natural extension of that in my mind We're we're, we're entering, we're, we're allowing other species to enter, not, not just humans, not just animals, uh, not just robots, but, but AI, but software. And I think kind of from a theoretical perspective, this, this is what, what makes it work. And, but it, practically this is just the right way to go. And what I've seen, and, and I, I've seen similar numbers to, to what you were saying, but there's, there's another way I like to think about it. So in, Let's say the let's say we the difficulty of a task is how long it would take. If it's a very simple task, like what's one plus one, you could say two very quickly. If I give you a very challenging, let's say differential equation or, or integral to solve, it'll take you longer. So the, the time it takes you to solve something is correlated to the difficulty of it. And so what we saw is around two, 2019, automation was powerful enough to automate things that I would say took humans around 10 seconds to solve. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is a rule of thumb. This is simple, but it's, it's a good way to think about it. When we saw the, the merging of humans, AI and software in 2022, we're seeing it be able to automate things that take human around five minutes to solve. Um, and so, uh, and, th and this is, tasks, let's say over 98% accuracy. And I think what's more impressive to me is, is the trend of this. Um, and so I, I can imagine in the future, it's gonna go to 10 minutes to 20 minutes and uh, it's gonna continue to automate more and more. And I also like what you said, because we see this as well. Like sometimes there's this fear that 
the AI and robots are going to take our jobs. And I, that is true, but I don't necessarily, in all cases, I think there are some bad cases, but see that as a bad thing because what the AI is doing is solving these mundane tasks that we as humans don't want to do or shouldn't be doing. We humans love being creative, interacting with other humans, being empathetic. And so the, I think the almost paradoxical thing is AI makes us more human. And I think that's another interesting thing we're seeing. Completely align with you on that point. Um, uh, it, and, and that's a good trans transition to the human aspect of those uh, technological transformations. Um, and, and we talk a lot about human in the loop, human-centered transformations. Uh, we talk a lot about democratization of uh, uh, artificial intelligence by using technologies like uh, low-code platforms that that require limited skills to build AI applications that make uh, AI accessible to most business users, basically, even those who don't know how to program or code. Um, and um, so to make it very simple, those are uh, programs that help you to, to drag and drop uh, parts of codes, for example, um, use, on user-friendly screens, uh, using wizards. Um, so basically, uh, the, the the benefits of using those type of technologies is 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 first of all to accelerate the speed of the transformation because you have obviously more hands more people in the company um, using those those uh, those programs um, but from my experience the most the most important is because everyone in the company is empowered to change their day-to-day -day work um, this drives a higher ownership and acceptance of AI and allows the shift of the company's culture to more digitization, automation, and, and, um, and AI. What's, what's your take around this and, and how do you work on this at, at Super AI? Yeah, so when we first started, and, and because I'm technical, we, we built a more technical platform that was designed for developers. We actually pivoted pretty early on because we saw a much more valuable and better market and we thought we could add more value by making this uh, a low code or, or no code platform and i think in general the rise of these low code no code auto ml is being driven by this massive surge in adoption of ai and ai is being adopted so fast that it's creating a really big talent gap and what low code, no code, auto ML does is it, is it solves this talent gap. And, and as you said, it, it allows you to harness and maintain uh, your, your growing AI machine learning momentum without getting blocked by this absence of talent. And it, and it really empowers people who aren't coders to get stuff done. And, and there's this old adage that uh, getting things done is better than getting it perfect. And, and low code and no code and auto ML, it doesn't get it perfect. Uh, developers are going to do it better, but it gets things done fast. And, and, and in my opinion, it's about not letting perfection be the enemy of progress. And so I think, I think it's a really great thing. And I'm excited to, to see the explosion of these tools. And, and we saw this yeah. firsthand and, and, and we still do offer uh, a full code platform, but we're actually seeing the adoption of our, of our no code and low code platform really take off. Excellent, and I see yes, I, yeah, I see it as a, as a key trend for the for, for the future, um, empowering a maximum of people in the com in companies to participate in those transformations uh, is 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 vital to get to get those transformation to scale. Brad, thanks thanks for that. Uh, let's talk now about the impact of automation and AI on jobs. We've talked about how AI brings new capabilities, how we can combine technologies to bring more value to companies. Now, what is the impact of those transformations on our society and, and on us? Um, for example, I've, I've read that 30 to 80% of all current jobs could be automated uh, in, in the next five to 20 years. Um, my take on this is um, there are different school of thoughts on, on the topic. And one of them is coming from the economists, which think that um, in the past uh, automation revolutions, 
um, while technology has changed a lot of things, new jobs have appeared. And, and we don't know yet what will be those new jobs in the future. And I keep on um, presenting this example that 10 years ago, no one would have known that today our world would count more than 3, billion, 3 million Uber drivers. Um, uh, another school of thought thinks that this change is, is going faster than, than before, that we won't have the time probably to, to train everyone to those new technologies. Um, Brad, what's your take on that? And, and how is super AI playing a role in, in this? So I think a bit of both of those uh, have some truth to them, kind of like anything, it's never usually on the extremes. And so what I, like to do and this is something ray dalio talks about a lot is if you see something happening in your lifetime um people think it's the first time it's happening it's the end of the world but often if you look this has probably happened multiple times but it just was before your lifetime and so if you look at similar scenarios uh for example in the 1800s, something like 95 percent of people were farmers and it's kind of single digit people are farmers now so really close to our lifetimes, there was kind of even something worse than, than the 80%, you said it was 95%. And during the Industrial Revolution, there were the Luddites destroying thimble factories because they, the machines were taking their jobs. And so, as you said, um, there, people still have jobs. It's not that because we're not farmers anymore or we're not building thimbles by hands that no one has a job because now there's uber drivers and, and now there's software engineers and and so new jobs do come and typically they're they're jobs that are higher on the intelligence range but the problem is as you said i i think there's two big problems um one comes from the, the concept of of telescoping evolution that each technological advancement happens faster and faster than the other. The agricultural revolution took over 10,000 years, the scientific revolution, 400 years, the industrial revolution, 150 years, and now the kind of the, the AI and technical revolutions are sometimes happening every 10, 20 years. And so previously, maybe you and your father and your grandfather and your grandmother and all these people did the same job and then maybe it had a switch. Now these changes are happening multiple times in the life in in one's lifetime and so i do think the kind of the second point you made that the speed the the fact that it's happening is nothing new and nothing that really worries me but the speed at which it happens and looking at the state of our education system i have faith in humanity that we'll figure this out because i know people personally who are trying to innovate the education system and and if these can if you can merge human and, and AI and improve the education system, then I think it'll work, but it's it's not there yet. And so it does make me nervous. And I, I do think that's a problem. Um, but I think the solution involves accepting, like we talked about, whether it's hyper automation, unstructured data processing, is that humans and machines need to work together to solve this problem because they both have strengths and weaknesses. Correct. and it's the faster politicians and, and decision makers figure that out, I think the faster we'll be in a good place. Yes. So it's so if I hear you well, it's about probably reviewing the way we educate, or at least the the, the subjects that that we that we uh, teach to our kids uh, to make them to make sure that those topics are bring skills that are complementary to to the to the capacities of, of technology so that we can work well together with technology as a, as a duo and and i think even more importantly rather than then teaching them the subjects is teaching them how to learn subjects because everything yeah. maybe even our kids the next generation probably everything they learn in school is not going to be useful i think the only things that are going to be useful are like emotional intelligence Maybe how to use Google and uh, and how to learn how to re-educate wow. yourself. And it, mm -hmm. It's going to be a stressful world, but I, I have faith. That exciting, we'll exciting. It. World. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ever moving. And I agree with you. Learning how to learn is a key skill of the future. 
Thanks, thanks, Brad. That was really a great discussion. Very exciting points. Um, yeah, that was fun. Um, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for yeah. for these. Uh, any any um, small word for the for the for, for the end that you want to share with with our audience? No, I I, I enjoyed our conversation. Um, I I think as as people approach their AI journey, I see a lot of a lot of hype around AI. And I, I think what I like to say is AI is just another technology. And if someone's promising that this can solve cancer and do everything, I would second guess that. And I would stick to the basics. Does it offer an ROI? Can we implement this? And, and nothing changes. And I think that's really important because sometimes when it comes to AI, people think it's magic and they throw all their intuition out the window and it's just like any other technology it's a very powerful technology it's changing the world and but i i think the, the sooner people realize it's just another tool in the toolbox the more it'll get adopted and and the more it'll improve our lives thank you brad very exciting and very inspiring um thanks for your thank time you, and uh and i hope to Talk to you soon. Thanks to the audience who listened to us and talk to you yeah. soon. Thanks, guys, for listening. Take care. Bye.